Good morning. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Paul North. Uh, I'm the founder and the MD of Illuminous Insight Software. Our business is around uh, helping small businesses to make the most of their data to really drive their productivity and uh, their profitability. So um, let's have a little look about what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Uh, so a quick agenda, talk about small data. What do we mean by that? What is it? Why is it important? The things, the problems that SMAs have with their small data. A thing called data democracy, which we'll cover in quite some detail. Then moving on to how, what we want to be doing is using small data rather than managing small data uh, and finishing off with how that can drive imagination and innovation. So let's get started. Uh, big data is a term I think most of us are familiar with. We've heard it on the news. We understand maybe that Tesco use it to send us the right vouchers and so on. But I'm a great believer that actually um, in small businesses, the data inside those businesses is the thing that will really make a difference for them. Particularly if you're a business in the B2B community, the data you hold is something which can be really powerful. And I call that, and lots of people call that, small data. So let's have a definition. There are loads. This is the one I'm going to work with for this morning. So the self-generated and stored data of a business drawn from any number of sources. Typically your accounting or ERP package, but it might be CRM or other packages too. Now most SMEs these days hold their data, of course, in digital form. But often this, this is information that kind of floats around in a sea of information, all in its own in little packages. You know, we might have a little chunk of information that looks after orders. We might have a little chunk that looks after the assembly of the orders or the manufacturing. We might have another chunk that looks after invoicing uh, and perhaps a final chunk that looks after delivery. Now, sure, there's some overlaps between some of these things, but typically these things just lie around and the data itself is kind of mute. It doesn't really speak to us about what's going on in the business. But of course, as I'm sure we all recognise, that data can be really powerful. It can really speak to us if we can only get it to talk. And it can give us really great information about where we've been as a business and where we are right now as a business. And all of that drives confidence in the decisions we can make for the future. And that's really what's going to make a difference. Let's have a look at that confidence thing. Uh, there was a really interesting piece of research done by the Harvard Business Review Analytical Services a few years ago. And they interviewed a whole load of uh, managers across the world and across businesses of a whole different load of uh, size. It's hundreds and hundreds of people about the availability and their confidence in their data and accessibility and so on. The overriding um, headline um, from this article was, executives, managers and professionals are plagued by inaccurate, obsolete or hard to access data, exacerbating the stresses of making decisions in real time. I'll bet we all resonate with that. It's not small business or big business. This is right across the board. It's a challenge for lots of people. There was one question that I thought was really illuminating. They asked the managers about whether they dis or disagreed or agreed with a certain set of statements. And there were two that I think really tell the story. So to the statement, I am confident that the important internal and external data I need are available and easy to access, pretty much half of the respondents would disagree with that statement. So half of them couldn't actually get to it. Kind of more scary, really. Uh, I'm confident about the accuracy of most of the data underlying my business decision. Not even all of it, just most of it. And a third of these managers wouldn't agree to that, which is really scary stuff, really. What we hear from, um, yeah, from, from clients and people we speak to is that in trying to get to that confidence, they need to analyse their data in some way. And of course, the way that they get to what they think is some confidence is with the thing that we all use which is static reporting, and that usually means Excel spreadsheets, doesn't it? That's the, the go-to tool. We're all familiar with the way this works, I'm sure. So you start with a report that you've grabbed out of the accounting system. It's probably on a piece of paper. You may have even had to go to someone else to get it for you because you don't do that bit. Um, you input that into your spreadsheet. You then do some clever stuff with Excel. You massage it, you filter it, you put in some calculations. If you're a power user, you might do pivot tables. You might do some clever stuff and you end up with some information which you typically then want to share, so you'll then share that around with other colleagues in the business. That's the aim of this process, isn't it? But we don't really do that, do we? We don't input to a spreadsheet. We often input to a spreadsheet because we're not great typists and, and errors happen. Then instead of doing what we think are some really clever and great calculations, what we do is we introduce some errors to it. 
and then we compound those errors because we use the same spreadsheet month on month and keep building with it. And in fact, of course, uh, research suggests that the vast majority of spreadsheets in businesses, particularly of big businesses, is that you know, 80 to 90% contain significant errors that cost millions of pounds. This is in big businesses with professional analytical people. So what chance in the SME of getting these things right every time? Really quite small. Even the last sharing bit can be fraught with problems, can't it? How many times do we send an email to the wrong pool, of which there are loads, uh, when, we, when we try and share something else? So even that bit's going to be quite difficult. Even if you can get all that stuff right, there are still some significant side effects with using that model for getting to your information. And it's about the fact that you know, we end up just drowning in this sea of information. And what we end up doing is we spend loads and loads of time <coughs> and loads of left brain activity creating and, and managing these spreadsheets. And we completely fill that organized systematic side of our brain and all our stamina with that activity. So when we get to the end of it, where we want to use that creative, intuitive, right side stuff to look at this data and see, so what's that telling me? We're kind of worn out, or it's two days later and we've got other jobs to do in the business. So doing that information can take a really long time. Now, of course, our small data um, can deliver great power to us if we can get to it. And of course, with any power comes responsibility and a need for control. And in businesses, we have um, control systems which work pretty much like the society ones. See if you recognize some of these. So we might have, in some businesses, a data dictatorship. And in the dictatorship, the man at the top is told, <coughs> says what you're entitled to get, and probably crucially, even when you are able to get it as well. Next layer down is the aristocracy. So in a data aristocracy, we get the spreadsheet kings, or the people at the top who really understand about these things, and only if you go and ask really nicely might they throw you some crumbs <coughs> that you might be interested in. At the bottom, and I think this is probably the majority of the SME space, we get the anarchy. We get that everyone gets whatever they can, however they can get it, and alternative facts abound. Uh, as I like to call it, you end up with multiple versions of the truth. And how many times have we been to a meeting where people bring their own spreadsheets, but they're not all quite the same answers at the bottom. Okay. But what about if we could go for that other type of, uh, of regime, the one that we like to live in too, a democracy? You know, how about if we're able to, to achieve a data democracy in which every employee is entitled to and can get to the data they need? So in a data democracy, everybody gets timely, direct access to the data they need to maximize efficiency. They can end up owning that data for themselves that they need on a day-to-day -day basis. And it then means that we can move into a much better position where we can use this side of the brain to use that data rather than this side to manage it. Trust me, this means the spreadsheet needs to go. Okay, because we can't do data democracy with spreadsheets. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that we've got some kind of BI tool that's doing that managing for us so we can start using it. And let's have a look at the benefits and things that we can get from using it. Firstly, interesting, Mike, Mike mentioned artificial intelligence. Um, what is it that we're going to use to do the analysis of this data now, now that we've got it easy? AI in the small business space to look at our small data, I think is a really distant dream. It's going to be a very long time before that kind of technology is going to come to us. So we need to use the other kind of intelligence. That's what we've got up here. Uh, there's a guy called Bryce Maddock, who is the CEO of a business, a big successful business in America called Task Us, who put it this way recently. Humans are not an important part of utilizing new data. They're the single most important part of the process. And we need, to, we need to release that to make sure that can happen. If we get that right, then we stop treating data as if it has a value in its own right and recognize that data has no intrinsic value unless it drives productivity and profitability. If you can make it do that, then we're on for the big wins. Now, if you're going to introduce a data democracy into an SME, we need to make sure we do everything possible to make sure that that data that we share is of the highest quality. Because if it's not, then we're going to introduce those problems that we were still getting in our spreadsheets. So what can we do to, it, to make sure we've got data quality? First, we need to look at what we can do to make it as accurate and complete as possible. Make sure everything is there that needs to be there. Obviously, a big way of doing that is, is minimizing any human input. So in whatever we do to create these data sets and so on, automate as much of it as we possibly can. When we've got all that, we are still going to find mistakes in it because somebody entered it in the first place somewhere. And a really good way to try and deal with that is some exception reporting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about exception reporting and, and how it can be quite simple and make a big difference. So, good example. Um, 
is being able to automate something to check, for example, customer account or product records where you might have some missing or some incorrect data. So if you're a business that relies upon analyzing your data by who the sales rep is and making sure that sales rep gets commission on what they do, if you've got customer accounts that don't have a sales rep in them, then you've got a problem. But it's really easy to create a report that automatically emails the person in the sales office to say, these accounts tonight don't exist with uh, a sales rep on them. Really importantly, if you do that and make sure that that exception reporting goes to the people who have the ability both to change but probably created it in the first place, what then happens, of course, is they very quickly get fed up with having to correct their mistakes and they start getting it right first time. Then we end up with quality data right at the beginning without this time lag and that can make a big difference. A couple of other examples of way things we might do, things like just looking for incorrect VAT codes. If you sell across, across, across the world and you need different VAT codes for different territories, it's really easy to set the rules up and check the exception reporting to be certain that you've got the right stuff in there. Another example, um, product pricing and margins. If you hold lists of products with selling prices and cost prices, and your typical margin is 30, 40%, whatever it might be, if you run an exception report that looks for anything in the system that has less than a given uh, barrier, then you can quickly find, again, where mistakes might have been made. So it helps us to get the quality. Now, what about what it can tell us? Um, first thing to, um, to think about is that without any context, data isn't information, it's just data. We need to add some context to it, and the more context we can add, the more information we can get from it. One good way of, of, uh, of setting context is, is the idea of setting budgets and targets. So if we take a little look at that, um, start with my, one of my favorite phrases, there is no perception without contrast. And I think this is true across life. Unless you've got something else to compare against, if you look at an individual thing, you have no idea if that's a good or a bad thing without any contrast to it. Um, if I was to say our sales this month were 1.2 million, is that a good or a bad result? We have no idea, but if I was to tell you what the budget was, you'd have a very clear idea whether that was a good or a bad result. So this is an area where we can really add value in there. When you're setting budgets, there's another really useful thing to think about. Uh, something came upon recently called Miller's Law. So uh, Miller was a professor and psychologist at Princeton, um, and he did some research in the 50s, um, in some empirical stuff, looking at individuals and finding out how much information they could hold in their mind at any one time to process lists of things. And what he discovered was, as the rule says, the number of objects an average human can hold in working memory is seven plus or minus two. So it's some particularly good people who can do nine and some particularly poor people who can do two. But it's typically seven is the kind of magic number. And in fact, the paper was originally called the magic number seven. If you have any more of those, uh, than seven things in a list, then simultaneously processing them up here becomes increasingly difficult. So if you're setting budgets where the top layer of your budget is 19 different things to look at, you're not going to look at it and have clever things happen up here that will give you insights. Breaking that down so that you've got you know, seven to nine at the top end, maybe subdividing it to go further down to look at it, will make intuition come much better. Um, interestingly, when you look at the original research, this um, average human was an average young adult human. Now, I know in, in my grand old age that I doubt if I've got seven left anymore. I think I'm probably nearer the six or the five, mm -hmm. so worth thinking about. Okay. We have a quick look at some examples from, uh, from some of our client work uh, in terms of how we can use this small data to get good increases in productivity and profitability. Start with productivity, one of my favorite stories. We have a client down in Basingstoke called GTK. They make custom cable assemblies. So here is one, one that's on the board there. So this thing is made up of 17 different components of different sizes all joined together. And they're made by hand. They do short, short stuff. So they make 50 or 100 of these at a time. They got 45 people who make piles of those every day for various other manufacturing people in the industry. A few years ago, they invested in a nice new ERP system called Iris Exchequer, which looks after all of their stuff for them. And one of the things it looks after is the work orders that go with these jobs. So when a new job comes in, they create a work order that looks something like this, that in essence, down the left-hand side, lists each individual item in that assembly and how many are required. The assembler's first job in the morning, having got hold of the work order that's going to be their job for the day, is to go to the warehouse and collect all the parts to take back to the bench to make it. Now, they have a massive warehouse with um, uh, 6,000 different places in it at the moment. And because of the nature of the way they work, things don't end up in the same place from one week to the next. So the first job is find out actually where it is. Now, what they used to do uh, was this process. So they'd print out that work order. And then the assembler would sit in front of a PC 
go into Exchequer and you would search the stock list of the 45,000 odd items they have in the stock list for the first item on that checklist. It opened up the item record, moved to another place on the record that showed where they could find it and find the places it was available today. They'd then write that location on the work order and go back onto item two and so on. As I say, this one's got 17 bits in it, so you can imagine how long that takes. Once they've done all that, they can then go to the warehouse, collect the stuff, and off they go. The operations director, a guy called Steve, um, knew that this was a productivity issue, had spoken to the guys, the assemblers, several times, and the answer he got back was, but that's how the system works. I, you know, I can't, I'm being as efficient as I can, but that's how the system works. His insight was that behind the exchequer, the data that's in there has the information about the work orders and it has the information about the locations, but exchequer can't join it together for you. But another report could. So the report was taken outside of exchequer and recreated that had all exactly the same information as the original work order, but crucially also today's locations. So the new process looks like this. Print the work order, job done. Picks off the printer, goes off the warehouse with his basket, collects the stuff. Basingstoke is quite a long way, and particularly from my understanding this morning's traffic, Steve decided not to get up early and come and join us this morning. Uh, but when I checked my slides with him last week, um, he dropped me back a note which adds some even more sort of flesh to this too. He said these things. We do that process on average 100 times a week. Some of our work orders have 50 lines in them. But it's not merely the cost of saving, cost saving in minutes, it's also got motivational benefits. This was a really drab job that people hated to do first thing in the morning. Their staff like to make things, that's what they're there for. So fiddling around in front of the computer and whatever, not what they want to do. So it made a big difference. So we have another client, um, uh, Central Foods, who uh, in Northampton, and they're distributors of frozen foods uh, to wholesalers and caterers around the UK. Uh, Gordon rang me a little while ago uh, with uh, a little story and an interesting question. And his story was he'd been to the stores that morning, a big cold store, and he'd kind of fallen over a rather large pile of chicken nuggets. I had this great vision of this nugget mountain. Um, and they sell a lot of these things, but there was rather more in the warehouse than he would have expected. He'd gone back to the office, done a little bit of, bit of checking up, and discovered that three months before, a client who bought loads of these things every month, about typically £9,000 worth, had stopped buying. Just like that, no reason why. Still buying loads of other stuff. And he rang me, and his question was, is there some way I could have found out about that sooner? What, anyway, it's taken me three months to find it because I fell over it, really. So what could I do to find it, find it sooner? I think he rang me because he knows I'm a bit of a data nerd and I do like a puzzle. And this was a nice little puzzle. So a little think about it. Um, and this is a really good example of how if you can create a rule to look in some data sets, you can come up with some answers that solve your problems. First part of that is, what's the problem we've got in the first place? So in this instance, this monthly £9,000 of a particular item by a customer had stopped. But that customer is still buying lots of stuff. Some other context around it, there are hundreds of customers. There are hundreds of products. The customers only buy some of the products, so it's not even as much as, as that one disappeared. Um, and not all of the customers buy regularly, so there's all sorts of different patterns going on. A little chat, and we came up ultimately with what's really quite a simple rule. And it's that we look at the sales of every customer and item pairing for the last seven months, of which there are thousands. But then we only look at the ones where for the first six months of the last seven months, they bought something every month. So that customer bought that item every month for seven, six months. But then last month, they didn't. So graphically, six months of sales, and then in the seventh month last month, nothing happened. We applied that rule and we put it back into the data. And we found that lost 9,000 pounds worth of chicken nuggets. So we were really pleased that the rule worked. It also found another 58 things that had been stopped buying with a typical average monthly value of about 58,000. So that was passed on to some sales reps who made some phone calls and, uh, and some business was won back again. So a really um, interesting way of looking at it. And in true data democracy fashion, this report is now something that each of the sales reps have for themselves. They look at it for their own customers. They can run it on their own. No, no help or skill required. Off they go. And once you get the hang of doing this kind of thing in, in your data, I you know, promise you all sorts of opportunities pop up um, that really can drive profitability and, uh, uh, and product productivity. A couple of other um, quick, quick uh, easy wins of things that I think are also worth thinking about that, that we see make a big difference. First one is customer profit margins. It's really interesting that in the majority of the businesses we've worked with, when we first went there, customer profit margins wasn't something they looked at. They looked at profit margins across the business and maybe across products, but not on an individual customer basis. 
And when we gave them the ability to see that, it nearly every time I had a phone call within a couple of days, oh, I just found something really interesting, this customer margin stuff. And it happens pretty much because of this. Mostly speaking, uh, it's around customer discounting. So the sales rep or the manager has had a little discussion with the customer and given them some discounts on certain items based on their buying patterns and all the rest of it. They'll do some calculations around that, probably in a spreadsheet, warning. Uh, and they'll then feed that spreadsheet into the accounts team who will put it onto the sales account. But there's rarely a feedback loop. At that point, the sales person, as far as they're concerned, that discount's happening, the customer's carrying on as they were, all great. And you go and look at it and you start finding out there are all sorts of things that have gone wrong. And it might be that the original calculation actually was flawed to start with. Very often, it's that the price got in incorrectly entered into the system. So the sales tech person managed to put you know, 21 instead of 12 or whatever it might be and something went wrong. Um, Another one that happens, of course, is that the customers are a bit smart, so they now cherry pick and only buy the stuff they're getting on discount, and they go and buy the other stuff that you're not discounting down the road. So suddenly you're selling all your stuff at the wrong margin. Um, and more recently, another, another way this has happened is um, with exchange rate variances. So you, you know, this wasn't something that was worrying us four or five years ago, but in more recent times, particularly if you're buying and selling internationally, um, customer margins on things that, uh, that either get bought or sold in or out of the country can change very rapidly as exchange rates change. Uh, so that feedback loop is really important. Uh, another good area for, uh, for, some, for some big wins on, uh, on profitability is, is in the stock area, uh, looking at things like old and slow moving stock. Typically businesses on an annual basis or so will do stock counts and look and find out what's in the business and do stuff on the balance sheet and whatever. But when you join that sales data to that stock data, you can start to get much more information about things like run rates and how long stock's been in, in, the, in the warehouse and so on. And again, with a data democracy, if you start feeding that information on a weekly or monthly basis to the guys in the warehouse who can deal with it, then rather than that being a real headache that people have got to come in over Christmas, they can deal with it as they go along. And of course, you know, the cost of having to move because your warehouse is full of old stuff, you can get around that if you can keep, keep it nice and tidy. Uh, next one, um, is worth a little look at is things like staff productivity. In most businesses, you know, the managers will look around and they'll know that that person seems to be particularly good at the job, but that person never seems to get through quite the amount of work. And is that because there's a skill issue or whatever? Is it this person's lazy and maybe it's time they, they move them on or whatever it might be? If you can quantify some of these things, then you can, make, you can analyze them and make a difference. So it's around finding a metric that will compare output from similar jobs. Trivial example, if you've got a sales office where you've got you know, a dozen people putting sales orders on into a system, you kind of know that that person who sits in the corner always seems to do more than others. But if you can measure that in some way, maybe some combination of order and line counts and so on, then you can get to um, uh, some information that will give you definite confirmation of the top and bottom performers. You can look for best practice and make a big difference. I was going to finish with, with this thing about you know, most SMEs are now only at the very start of this kind of data analysis stuff. Um, and it's around getting them into, the, into it small time and building on it. And I titled the, you know, this classic quote, every journey starts with a single step or a first step. I Googled that to find a picture and all I got was the cheesiest set of fridge magnets you could imagine. Uh, so I thought, no, I'm not gonna go there. I'm just gonna put up a few words. So it's this thing of don't expect to go in with a big leap, get started on small and let things grow. Confidence will gain and people will start to think creativity once you give them the space to do so and they get some things that make a difference. Um, the increases might be small to start with, but they often become really dramatic. And as the snooker player said a few years ago, the more practice you do, the luckier you get with it. So it's, you get better the more you do. Okay. Um, so, quick look back over the agenda. I think we've covered uh, the things that we talked about. Uh, just a tiny quick plug at the end, if I may. Um, this is our software that helps our clients get a data democracy in their business and, and share their data. Thank you.